everybody. We're here with another mini lecture. Uh, today's mini lecture is going to be on Austin's colony. So that should be an interesting one. Um, first starts off with Moses, then goes to Stephen, and then a whole bunch of other people try to do the same thing. That's the short version. You can stop watching now. No, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, yeah, it should be a pretty interesting one. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns, of course, if anything mystifies, horrifies, or amazes anybody. All right, so Moses Austin had himself a deal with Spain. Spain left, became Mexico. Mexico then says, you know what, I think I'll like the same deal uh, as well. So Mexico agreed to sustain the permission that was granted by Spain for uh, American colonizer Moses Austin. Uh, you're not used to hearing that name, I assume. <clears throat> he initiated a large-scale American immigration into Texas. At least he tried to. Uh, he died. Uh, his son, Stephen Austin, took the lead in establishing American colonies in Mexican Texas. And then you get the new Mexican Empire rises, and then the Republic. And there's a whole bunch of upheaval that goes on for about three years, between 1821 to 1824. Uh, Mexican politics uh, gets divided between people who are centralists, want a strong national government, and those who are more decentralized and want some sort of, uh, or a lot of local autonomy. And then American immigration into Texas eventually results in Anglo-American dominance over all of the local commercial and political activities. And these Texans, or Texians as they refer to themselves, increasingly favor local government, uh, federalist policies, and occasional clashing with the national government. So, <coughs> excuse me. That's the uh, preview part. Now here's the actual uh, details. Anglo-Americans uh, move into Texas during the late Spanish period from 1815 onward. Most of the time when they're moving in, they don't have permission to do it. That's right. They were illegal immigrants. There's no title. There's no permission. They are squatters is probably a good way to say that. Moses Austin had uh, relocated to Spanish Missouri before uh, financial losses during the Panic of 1819 and... Uh, he decided a, he's going to have a plan of establishing an Anglo-American colony in Spanish Texas. By the way, when we're looking at the map here, we're actually looking at uh, what eventually becomes two separate colonies, uh, Coahuila and Tejas, uh, or two separate um, states within Mexico. Uh, but right now they're just referred to as Coahuila y Tejas. So there's that. Um, there we go. Yep, that's his Moses Austin. Uh, he travels with his slave, who's named Richmond, and um, he meets his acquaint uh, acquaintance, the Baron of Bastrop. He persuades Mexican authorities in Texas to take over his colonization plan. Now, here's a big question, is why would Spain, then Mexico, agree to this sort of thing? Probably the big reason would be is because... Um, Spain and Mexico were not actually interested in colonizing themselves. As we have already learned, it has taken a long time for them to even start to gain a little bit of an interest in Texas. So now they start thinking, okay, you know what, if we can get these Americans to do it, fine. They're going to come over here, they're going to be Mexican citizens, they're going to learn the language, they're going to um, do business with us, they're not going to be sending all their business back to uh, the U.S., that's the deal. That's what we're looking for. Obviously, we know that didn't work out that way. Uh, a lot of that ha does have to do with the ideas and upheaval in the government itself. Now, Austin leaves San Antonio in late uh, 1820. Um, he's back in Missouri by the summer of 1821, but he comes to illness along the way. It's a pretty difficult, tra uh, difficult journey for him, and he dies of exposure. Now, one way of telling this would be his son Stephen makes a promise to his father on his deathbed that he's going to wind up taking up the mantle. No, actually, Stephen was a lot more reluctant. Uh, Stephen Austin had joined his family in Spanish Missouri, but he'd relocated to Arkansas. Then he'd gone to New Orleans. And then finally, he says, fine, I'll fulfill my father's wishes. Probably because he saw that maybe there's some, some money to be made in it. He, encour he was encouraged by Spanish authorities in Louisiana uh, in order to pursue the title that his father had been given, the not title as in, you know, the Baron of whatever, but uh, just the title to his father's grant. So he crosses into Texas in the summer of 1821. He explores the region south of San Antonio, down the Colorado and Brazos Rivers. 
and he sends letters back to Louisiana, and basically he's using this as advertisement uh, for people to be able to move off into um, what at the time was Mexican Texas. There is a picture of a young Stephen Austin. He plans and succeeds in making a substantial profit in land and money for facilitating the settlements as an empresario. He attracts hundreds of families by selling land at a fraction of the price that you could in the United States. Now, at this point, the U.S. was selling land. Um, the U.S. government was actually selling land. That's one of the ways they funded a lot of things. They were selling land in order to get more people to move out west. Now, he is selling it at a much lower cost. So it's going to be attracting a lot more people out here. Um, however, in 1823, uh, the Mexican government is overthrown, Iturbide, no matter how many times I say it when I'm recording, I always mess it up. Uh, he threatened the entire arrangement, but Austin's connections and his persistence uh, was still left intact with the new Congress that came in, the new Republican government of Mexico at that time. Uh, this also becomes administratively separated as a, a department of the state of Coahuila, Texas's southwestern boundary is set at the Nueces River. That's important. It's set at the Nueces River at that point, not the Rio Grande. Uh, and then the state constitution establishes four municipal zones around traditionally Spanish and Mexican towns of San Antonio, La Bajia, um, which is renamed Goliad. Uh, Nacogdoches, and Austin's colony on the Brazos, uh, San Felipe. You get four additional contracts and over 1,700 more families follow as Austin successfully completes one empresarial contract after another. Others, like the Mexican, you may recognize this map, you just saw it a minute ago. Uh, other empresarios such as uh, De Leon, they bring Mexican, they bring European, they bring American colonists into Texas as well. So it's not just Austin doing this, other people do it. Uh, as well. Uh, his ambitions were often imitated. Austin's ambitions were often imitated, but they were a lot less successful. He was a great uh, salesman in this regard. He got a lot more people. Many other empresarios did attract thousands more Anglo-Americans to Texas uh, throughout the 1820s and 1830s. Uh, nearly 10,000 Anglo-Americans, largely in the American South, reside in Texas by 1830. Sorry, largely from the American South or in Texas by 1830. They overwhelmingly kept their Protestant faith, despite the legal expectation that they would convert to Catholicism, and they also did not learn Spanish, uh, despite the fact that that was the expectation as well. Now, most of these settlers engage in clearing land and establishing subsistence farms around in the 1820s, uh, although there are limited market export um, Farming is really the big way that people make make their living. Uh, and it merges in the 1830s. It becomes very prevalent. And then you do start to get some export in the 1830s as well. Now, Anglo-American Southerners believe that slavery was the only way available for the quick establishment of subsistence farms in Texas. 25% of the population of Austin's colonies were enslaved um, African-American laborers. <clears throat> um... This gets a little more complicated because you have property rights and uh, development goals led Mexican administrations in the 1820s. Uh, they expressed their hot hostility to slavery, but they don't take a lot of action um, because they don't necessarily want to anger these people that are coming in, uh, the new people that are coming in. They still want the flow of people coming in here because it won. Uh, since they are now legal immigrants, it makes it so that it's keeping the illegal immigrants out of Texas, and they are rapidly developing the area, which is exactly what both the Spanish and the Mexican government wanted. But you also get this idea of federalism going through the Mexican government this time, and they're basically saying, oh, well, we'll leave it to the states. And then uh, the Constitution in 1827 of Coahuila y Tejas, um, explicitly does set slavery on the gradual path to abolition. Austin had actually gotten more or less non-enforcement in his colonies. He had the, he'd persuaded the Mexican um, 
administration that slavery had led to development, so they basically just kind of turned a blind eye to it and said, okay, well, you know, he's going to do what he's going to do. Uh, Texas permits Anglo settlers to indenture their slaves and to hold them in a legal state of freedom, but not actual slavery, when in fact it was actual slavery. Then in September of 1829, the national government emancipates all slaves in Mexico, but Texas authorities suppress the news of emancipation until they secure an exemption for Texas uh, that December. Austin and the, and the Anglo colonists claims that slavery was integral to development of the frontier. So it has an interesting uh, aspect to slavery in Texas uh, right from the beginning as the uh, colony is developing. By 1830, the nearly 4,000 Tejanos uh, that were concentrated into the population centers like San Antonio and Nacogdoches, as you can see on the map here, had become a minority in the population uh, of the 10,000 Anglo-American settlers and amongst the whole bunch of other people that had been moving in as well. Tejanos were sustained uh, basically as ranching as their primary economic activity, and as you get a lot of farmers moving in, that is not conducive to ranching. They actually butt heads several times because farmers tend to want to not have their crops eaten by cattle that are roaming, roaming around and grazing. And then the Tejano elite were torn between the maintenance of their Hispanic heritage, but also trying to support the economic development that was going on in Texas, uh, becoming more independent on the economic development and the immigration that was going on in Texas as well. And then more than 20,000, um, oops, I, got, I thought I had another slide there. More than 20,000 Texas Indians outnumbered both the Anglos and the Tejanos, uh, but they were ethnically divided, they were politically divided, and they were pretty widely spread across the state, whereas the Tejanos and the Anglo-Americans uh, that were here were concentrated in certain areas. So while they were outnumbered um, by the Native Americans, they were not necessarily uh, seen more or less as a threat because it was easier to divide and conquer uh, them if need be. So that's all I have on Austin's colonies. Uh, again, let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you.